You've held it in your hands, you've worked it, brushed it off your clothes, and you probably take it for granted. It's soil, or in other words, dirt, loam, clay, mud, and muck. And it's probably one of the most remarkable elements of creation. Well, it's interesting, um, you know, some people refer to the soil as dirt. To a soil scientist, dirt is a dirty word. And I think in general, people need to think about soil as soil and not dirt. They need to see it as something that needs to be nurtured like any other life. The wonder of creation, soil, the foundation of life on this day of discovery. Soil. It's so common that we can easily forget how precious it is. And it's so rare in the universe that we can easily miss its significance to our planet. Soil is the foundation for all living things, including humanity. So what is this vital material out of which all of life arises and to which all of life eventually returns? It doesn't look like much, just a layer of fine mineral particles and organic material in which plants take root. Yet this amazing material is the virtual breeding ground for all life on Earth. To appreciate the value of soil, we need to understand its origins. Soil's chemical elements are stored inside solid rocks and lava. To accelerate the release of nutrients, a rock must be broken into smaller pieces. This is done through weathering and erosion. Glaciers also help by grinding up large rocks, releasing vast quantities of nutrients that eventually combine with dead plants and animal life to make soil. Planet Earth is unique in the cosmos for having this wonderful life-giving soil. The lack of rich organic soil is one reason that all other planets in the universe are void of life. Where is life possible? The moment we know of one place in the entire visible universe in which life can exist, and it's on this thin film on the surface of a single terrestrial planet around one small yellow star called the Earth. That's the only place we know of in the entire universe in which life is possible. Imagine how special that is. Uh, a thin layer on a planet perhaps 10 miles deep in which all of the life that we know of in the universe can and must exist. To get an idea about the extreme rarity of soil in the universe, imagine the Earth as an apple. Cut it in half and examine the flat side. A tiny rim of red skin barely shows at the outer edge. That slim arc represents the soil thinly spread across the surface of the entire planet. And so it's just this thin layer of the Earth that supports life. And you have to then think of the amount of this surface of the earth that's water, desert, and places that are not very productive. So in the end, it's only a small slice of this earth that has soil that supports the billions of people that are there. The soil is really the, the physical basis for all our existence. Plants come from the soil. Things that are made from the plants that come from the soil. Uh, the animals, all the animal resources that we have, ultimately come from the soil. But even things such as uh, your plastic shopping bags, metal to make uh, automobiles, these also come from the soil. Plastics come from oil, which comes from the earth. Originally came from, again, plants and animals. And so we see this, the constant recycling back to the soil. Soil is the anchor of the biosphere, that part of the earth and its atmosphere where all life exists. There's a lot of speculation that whatever happened here on the earth probably happened countless times elsewhere, so that the earth was really quite an ordinary place. We now know uh, that the Earth is very likely to be uh, exceedingly rare, at least Earth-like conditions are very rare in the universe. The vast majority of places 
not just in our solar system, but uh, throughout the universe, are going to be hostile to life. They simply won't have the necessary ingredients that you need in a planetary environment uh, for life to exist and to prosper. And so when you look at all the things that life needs in a planetary environment, you come to realize just how special a place the Earth really is. Why would the universe need to be so vast and seemingly infinite if all life was concentrated on this one tiny terrestrial ball? Is the apparent absence of life anywhere else in the cosmos a clue to human significance? Was it somehow intended that life should exist here and that it should exist for a defined purpose? Imagine that you had vast powers and could create a life-sustaining planet from raw ingredients. What would the ingredients be that you would need? Well, first you need, of course, the right kinds of elements to build a rocky planet like the Earth called a terrestrial planet. Uh, metals and elements heavier than hydrogen and helium that could that build the structure of the planet. The planet itself needs to be made of the right materials in the right form. For instance, the Earth has a liquid iron core that rotates, and in the way it rotates, it creates a magnetic field, literally a force field that protects the surface of the Earth and the atmosphere from bombardment from rays uh, from the cosmos in general and from the sun. Uh, then you need the planet to be the right size. If it's too small, it won't be able to hold an atmosphere that life needs on its surface too large, and it will end up holding too many things like hydrogen, and you end up with a gas giant planet. Then the planet actually needs something like a large, well-placed moon that stabilizes the planet's tilt on its axis. It's that tilt that gives us the, the diversity of climate patterns on the surface of the Earth that makes it such a hospitable planet for life. Life. Then that planet needs to be in the right place, the right neighborhood within the solar system, the so-called Goldilocks zone uh, around a star where it's not too hot and not too cold for liquid water because you need liquid water as a, a necessary ingredient for life. Then you need the right kind of planetary neighbors like the Earth has. Planets like Jupiter and Saturn, for instance, these gas giants in the outer part of the solar system, actually protect the inner part of the solar system, Earth's neighborhood, uh, as it were, from the bombardment of too many comets in the outer part of the solar system. Then you need to be in the right kind of galaxy, our home galaxy, the Milky Way, is the right age and size to have the kind of elements, materials that you need to build an Earth-like planet. And then you actually need to be in the right neighborhood within the galaxy. You don't want to be too close to the center of the galaxy, which is very dangerous, or too far out on the edge where there aren't elements for building an Earth. You have to get all of these things and many more just right the same time and place to build a single habitable planet like the Earth. What are the essential conditions required to support life? First, moderate temperature. Second, a continuous supply of energy. And third, essential chemicals. To moderate temperature, water and the layer of atmosphere surrounding the Earth protects life and produces a cycle of rain and evaporation that controls temperature changes like a huge central heating and cooling system. Then to support life, continuous energy comes from the sun. The sun warms our planet and sustains the food and fuel we burn. Living organisms also need a variety of the essential chemical elements like carbon and nitrogen to survive. And the Earth's soil is a storehouse of these essential building blocks of life. But water is by far the most important ingredient for life. That's in part why the science academies of the world spend billions of dollars on the search for water on other planets. Without water, there can be no life as we know it. Without a constant recycling of water, Earth's temperatures would be similar to those on Venus and Mars, too cold or too hot for life to exist. But for water to recycle, it needs a place to be absorbed and then released slowly to evaporate. And the only places that can happen are in oceans or in the soil. On Earth, water absorbs the sun's energy as it evaporates into the vapor phase. Vapor and warm air rise near the tropics and sink near the poles. This causes winds to blow. Winds move vapor toward higher altitudes where it releases the absorbed energy and becomes rain. This constant absorbing, releasing, and redistributing of solar energy by water 
is called the hydrological cycle, Earth's enormous circulatory system. But without soil, there would be no hydrological cycle. Water would constantly evaporate and never stay on the ground long enough to break down organic material and feed living organisms so necessary for plants and animals to survive. The Earth's unique atmosphere, its water and its soil, make our planet a remarkable incubator and preserver of life. Because of the apparent uniqueness of life on Earth, some astrophysicists have proposed a theory, the Anthropic Principle. The Anthropic Principle states that the universe appears to have a purpose, and that that purpose is to support life, especially human life, on this tiny speck of a planet. According to the Anthropic Principle, it takes a universe, with all of its planets, stars, and physical laws woven together and fine-tuned to make Earth the living planet that it is. After decades of rejecting the idea of an intelligent designer, many naturalistic scientists now confess that the universe itself, and especially our living planet, demonstrate the necessity of a godlike mind as the source of the cosmos and of the planet that is the home of such rich and diverse material life, our good and fruitful Earth. Perhaps no one appreciates the fruitfulness of our planet more than the farmer, who every day marvels at nature's life cycle. Through planting, cultivating, and harvesting the crops that provide for our food. The poets of ancient Israel often exulted over the wonder of life rising from the soil. The Lord waters the hills from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. Psalm 104. In soil, with all its uh, valuable nutrients, is the life and breath of our farm. There is no escaping that we want to be a part of the soil. We want to touch the soil. I'd like to show you our soil if I could and why it works. If you see all the, the density of our plants, it's very difficult to actually see our soil, see all the organic uh, residue that's accumulated. And as we get down, uh, you can see a, a earthworm hole right there. There's a little uh, insect running. These are, would be pretty good size uh, for what else is under the soil. That's healthy. You can smell the health of the soil. What's the recipe for this amazing life-giving substance called soil? All soils are made up of particles of sand, silt, and clay. And those three elements make up all soils around the globe. It's the different percentages of these particles, in addition to organic material and water, that determine how well each type of soil can produce and sustain life. The small grains of this, uh, of this plant are exceptionally nutritious. They have almost twice as much protein as corn and a much better mix of amino acids in that protein. Understanding soil and its capacity to be fruitful is a major work of ECHO, an agricultural research center in Fort Myers, Florida. ECHO networks with people and agencies around the world to address the interrelated problems of poverty and hunger. The people of ECHO recognize that understanding the structure of soil is a key factor in addressing hunger. And if you have a lot of clay, you have a clay soil. And clay soils are okay for some respects. They hold water very well, they hold nutrients very well, but they're also really hard. 
They're hard to work with. They're hard to dig in. They're hard to plant in. They're hard for roots to grow down into because of that clay structure. If you have more silt or sand in your soil, you may have a, a clay loam or a sandy loam or a sandy soil. A sandy soil obviously has a lot of sand particles in it. And sandy soils, again, they have some advantages. They're very easy to work with. It's really easy to plant in and to hoe in, to build a garden, but they don't hold water very well. When you water them, the water just runs straight out. They don't hold nutrients very well. They have very few nutrients in them naturally because of the nature of sand. So they have a lot of disadvantages as well. The soil works a lot like a sponge. Without soil, there would be no way to absorb water or to store it on earth. The best kind of soil is a loam soil, which has a good mixture of sand, silt, and clay. It holds water very well, it holds nutrients very well, and it's also fairly easy to work with. It's not so hard like a clay soil would be. In just a teaspoon of healthy soil, you can have up to a billion bacteria from 25,000 different species. Without soil, you could not sustain plant life, which processes the sun's energy and supplies food for animals and ultimately for us. Thread by thread, various life forms weave together a terrestrial web of life. Plants are the primary producers. Through photosynthesis, they transform solar energy into chemical energy and store it in organic matter. Animals are consumers. They eat the organic matter and redistribute it to fertilize the soils. Microorganisms are decomposers and they decompose the organic matter into elements that enrich the soil, which in turn helps plants grow. Billions of microorganisms decompose dead plants and animals, returning the essential elements back into the soil, which provides food for new plants to grow. It tends to humble us when we recognize that the same elements that make up soil, namely nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, oxygen, and water, also make up our own bodies. This is a truth expressed by a verse found in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Genesis chapter 3. Those are the two chief resources that God gives us. The soil that he uses to create us, and then man himself. Our creativity and our capacity to use this soil and the ground that God has given us. Uh, both to fulfill human needs and to glorify God. Take these three English words that we're familiar with, the word humble, the word humus, uh, life-giving soil, and the word human, all resemble each other. It's the same thing in Hebrew, in the biblical language. Adama refers to the ground, and Adam is both the proper name of a man, uh, and the man, Adam, and man generically, mankind, humankind. There's a relatedness in the way in which we speak of these things between the ground and the soil and the humility, the humbleness of the ground. All uh, of us in some way relate to the ground, both come from the dust of the earth and return to it, uh, and our humanity, so that human beings aren't uh, ghostly beings, angels, or disembodied spirits that just happen to be sitting in physical bodies temporarily. We are ensouled bodies or uh, composite spiritual material creatures so that it's part of our essence to be embodied creatures. I love the farm. I older I get, I think the more I love the farm. And seeing the crops grow, plant them and see them grow and, and go through harvest and, and it's good. People like Duane and his wife are a vanishing breed. Farmers who actually live on the land, love the soil, and enjoy working it. They're truly the descendants of Adam who first tilled the soil. Farming was man's first occupation, following a pattern set by the Creator himself. The Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, 
and he took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Genesis chapter 2 When I was growing up in Ohio, I would envision Adam and Eve in the garden eating apples and pears and cherries, uh, hickory nuts, things like that that I was familiar with. Uh, but now that I've been an echo and been exposed to what God has placed in the world, I realize that Adam and Eve may have been eating black sapote fruit, macadamia nuts, pulisans, chompadex, atamoyas, sugar apples, cherimoyas, cherry of the Rio Grande, Suriname cherry, imbies, wampies, soursops. Uh, it's, it's just incredible what resources God has put in fruit trees that are in this world. Working and taking care of soil as the source of our food and our health remains without doubt one of the most vital of all human occupations. color and flavors that burst from Earth's soil are amazingly diverse. Fruits and vegetables all wondrously appearing from a tiny seed. But the soil is also the source of vital non-living products as well. The cycle of nature transforms plant life into the black gold of oil using little more than heat, pressure, and time. Dead organic material accumulates on the bottom of oceans, riverbeds or swamps, mixing with mud and sand. Over time, more sediment piles on top, and the resulting heat and pressure transforms the organic layer into a dark and waxy substance known as kerogen. Left alone, the kerogen molecules eventually crack, breaking up into shorter and lighter molecules composed almost solely of carbon and hydrogen atoms. Consider these little-known facts about soil. Almost all of the antibiotics that we take to help us fight infections were obtained from soil microorganisms. Approximately one acre of land is used to supply the food for each person in the world. The average person consumes approximately 2,000 pounds of food each year. And depending on location and climate, it takes from 100 to over 500 years to form an inch of soil. Soil is like a cupboard with hundreds of foods, spices, and compounds in it. It's a virtual storehouse for the many ingredients that soil uses to make our food, like water, chemicals, and nutrients that we can't live without. When you take the ingredients required to create the many different soil types that provide for the diversity of life around us and combine them into their specific recipes, the variety is astounding. In the United States, there are more than 70,000 soil types. While many of these soil types are not directly related to the production of our food, almost all of them are indirectly linked to our food and our health. All soils have a function that relate to issues like climate control, water absorption, evaporation, nutrient cycling, or simply assisting in the breaking down of minerals to help create more soil. Wherever soil is found, a foundation is being laid for life. The many landscapes of Earth provide diverse environmental conditions, from very hot to very cold, from wet to dry, from gentle to violent. Deserts, forests, alpine regions, grasslands, Volcanic regions and mountainsides all reflect different temperatures and rainfall determined primarily by the type of soil in each of these ecosystems. The wonder of soil 
is that the land not only gives us its body, but offers us its beauty as well. People often forget about soils because they're just under your feet and they they don't even know they exist or they don't pay a lot of attention to it. They think of the things that grow out of the soil, but they don't think of the soil itself. It's a good thing to know what kind of soil you have so that you'll have an idea how hard it will be to work in your soil and if there's anything you can do to make your soil better. If you have a clay soil, how can you make it better? If you have a sand, how can you make it better? And the reason it's important to, to have a good soil is so that you can produce good crops. If the soil doesn't have nutrients or can't hold water, then when you plant things, they may dry out or there may not be enough nutrients to support that growth to produce your tomatoes or your corn or whatever it is that you're hoping to eat from that plant. There's a simple technique that can help us determine what kind of soil we have. If you could roll it into a ball, it meant that you did not have sand. If you can't make a ball, you have sandy soil. Once you have your ball of soil, then you try to roll it into a cylinder. If you can do that, then you have a sandy loam. Then you try to take that cylinder and connect the two ends. If you can connect the two ends, but it has cracks, then you have a clay loam. And if you can connect the two ends of your cylinder with no cracks, then you have a clay. So it was a simple tool, a simple technique to be able to, again, see what kind of soils you have. And this is the life of the soil. And this is often underestimated in the definition of soil. We often think of soil as defined by particles and texture and what type of mineral is present. And this is very important. But what is often underestimated and more complex to understand is the soil biology, those organisms that are hard to see. For organisms to live, certain environmental conditions such as proper temperature and moisture must exist. And the organisms must be supplied with energy and nutrients or food. All the animal and mineral nutrients necessary for life are contained within this biosphere. Nutrients contained in dead organisms or waste products of living cells are transformed back into compounds that other organisms can reuse as food. And this recycling of nutrients is necessary because there is no source of food outside the biosphere. Energy is needed to support the functions that organisms perform, such as growth and reproduction. It's the only requirement for life that is supplied from a source outside the biosphere. This energy comes from the sun. But how does the Earth store the sun's energy? In water and in the soil. Soil stores water and nutrients for plants to grow in. Plants are the producers. Animals are the consumers. Microorganisms are the decomposers. They help dead plants and animals find their way back into the soil to replenish it with nutrients. And so the cycle continues. Life arises from the soil, flourishes, and then dies and returns to the soil. It's this foundational fact that gives meaning to the Christian funeral tradition of casting a handful of soil onto a casket and repeating from Genesis, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. The soil provides both our womb and our tomb. Compost is basically a quick definition. It's just the, the decomposition of organic matter. It's, it's the breakdown of organic matter by organisms. So bacteria and fungi um, begin to consume this, these ingredients you bring into a pile. You, you're bringing in green grass, you're bringing in straw, you're bringing in manure and they immediately start to break them down. That's why a compost pile heats up. People wonder why they get hot. In fact, one year I baked potatoes in a compost pile. It got so hot. Nutrient cycling is an important part of understanding soils because nutrients in, in a particular ecosystem are found primarily in the dead litter that's on the ground or in the growing biomass or else in the soils. And each ecosystem, they tend to accumulate in one or another of those areas. 
So in the prairie soils, they accumulate in the soil. So that's the primary place where nutrients are found. In the rainforest, they primarily accumulate in the biomass. You know, in the fall in the Midwest, they're in the litter on the ground, in the leaves. And there's thousands and thousands of other types of interactions going on that we don't even understand. We're just beginning to understand what's going on in soil, this complex interaction of how nutrients go from a piece of wood back into this darker soil and then into a form that the plants can take up. Just in a teaspoon of healthy soil, you can have uh, up to a billion bacteria from 25,000 different species. You could have 8,000 species of fungi present. And these uh, organisms are so critical to, to healthy soils and, and can be the measure of productive soils, but, but are often overlooked, these small guys in the big scheme of things. What's really amazing and thrilling is that God uses the the small things, the bacteria and fungi and, and maybe the despised things like worms and, and termites to actually support this giant redwood tree in a, in a redwood forest or this tropical rainforest. That life is, as we see it above ground, is deeply connected to life below ground. And that's amazing. The abundance of life and organic matter in the soil is related to the abundance of life on its surface. Life-rich soil produces luxuriant plant life. Soil without a great deal of life and organic matter produces an entirely different landscape. This is evident in the United States as one moves from the stony soil of New England onto the deep sod of the Midwestern prairies. Prairies which gradually give way to arid places like much of Utah, Nevada, and northern Arizona where topsoil is sparse. Prairie soils are considered fine textured and fertile because of the abundant grasses that grow on their surface. Because of their vast root systems, prairie grasses prevent soil erosion from wind and dry weather and stop encroaching deserts from expanding while keeping the temperatures cooler. Without soil to preserve water on the land, Earth would be a desert wasteland. Without organic material and microorganisms in the soil to break it down, water would not remain on the land. That's why where there are no dead plants or animals in the ground, water is not absorbed and is lost through evaporation. Desert ecosystems with wide expanses of sand are perfect examples of this. On the edge of such regions where topsoil diminishes, even small climatic changes can dramatically alter the quality and nature of soil, requiring farmers to be extra careful in their soil conservation practices. One of the events in the history of North America that's related to soils was the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. And I had a grandfather who left the Midwest and went to Montana to farm during that era before the Depression, when so many people were going to the Great Plains. And what happened is we encouraged people to go out there, they plowed up all the grass, and then the dry decade came and the wind just picked up the soil and it went as far as several hundred miles out into the Atlantic, past Washington, D.C. As a farmer, the uh, number one rule for, for soil is to keep the soil covered. This protects against uh, erosion, whether the erosion be from, from wind or from rain or from uh, water runoff of any sort. Uh, the protection comes uh, as kind of a a hat. If you wear a hat on your head, it protects you from the sun, it protects you from the rain. The analogy of soil needing a hat is most fitting in forested landscapes. Forest cover is one of the most important preservers and conservators of soil. The trees are the best source for feeding our soils and for building our soils. The tall trees when you see a tall tree, you can be sure that there are, are going to be roots that go down just about as far 
down into the soil as that tree goes up into the air. And as those roots go down, they go down into the parent material, which is mostly a mineral rock or gravel or a bedrock down, and they dissolve those minerals, pull them back up into the plant, and they use them to feed the leaves and the branches of the trees. Then when the leaves fall and the branches fall and they decompose, they add minerals to the soil to help build that soil. The leaves add organic matter to the soil and so you have the mineral matter and the organic matter that is the food that helps to build and maintain the soil. Trees depend on soil for stability, nutrients and water. Most nutrient cycling takes place in the top two feet of soil where supplies of air, water, and food allow microorganisms to thrive. But the richness of life in the forest can be deceptive. Forests in the temperate regions often grow in soil relatively rich and deep. But almost contrary to logic, the most lush forests on Earth, tropical rainforests, have thin soils that once laid bare will quickly weather away, leaving a virtual desert. In comparison to the prairie, the rainforest has most of its nutrients in the canopy and all the growing matter. Now that's why there's a great concern of, about deforestation in the rainforest as opposed to places in the upper latitudes. Because when you take that, that forest away, the, there's, there are no nutrients left in the ecosystem. So it has a very difficult time ever coming back. It can't sustain itself once the forest is gone. Or you have some places like a desert where there's very little decomposition because it's so dry and there's also very little growth. So you have very few nutrients altogether. So one of the challenges in places where people go in and irrigate in the desert is that soon the nutrients are gone because they're starting out with an ecosystem that has few nutrients to begin with. And Soil is an incredible thing because what it does is it tells you about the history of a place. It tells you about the climate. You can see climate change if you look, actually look at the, the side of a soil cut. It tells you something about past vegetation. It tells you about the potential vegetation and agriculture of a place. So in a way, it's the composite of everything that's going on environmentally in that place. So this is a good representation of one, you can see the sand, the silt, and then on the top the humus or organic content that floats. You can read soils in a variety of ways. One way is to look at its texture. In my house in Michigan I have sandy soil and when I first moved here I had never seen soil like that before because I was from Iowa and Illinois where it was black and had a whole different texture and this tells you something about Michigan in this place so it's almost like reading a place. The blackness of the soil is one of the main measures of how productive and rich it is and that blackness is a reflection of the humus that's there. And so we have like cacao or chocolate grown and it's grown under shade and so the glyrosidia leaves are able to come down and, and, and add fertility to the soil and if you look in this soil here, you see it's really dark. There's a high concentration of organic matter and it's beautiful. There's, there's life in this soil. So we see once again uh, here where this soil was once, once white beach sand is now dark and full of life. And life below the surface is deeply connected to life above the surface. In addition to creating trees and plants to protect soil, our Creator made soil to be a cleaner system that filters contaminants, oils, herbicides and silt out of our waterways and purifies our water and food sources. The, the blessing and just the incredible creation that God created, just the way that everything works together and, and uh, the processes that are in place of decomposition and and minerals in the soil, feeding plants, and plants doing all these incredible things that are so complex in order to produce food to nourish us, and it's those things that, that we eat. Just when you think about all the interconnectedness and, and 
just the way that God created such an incredible universe that, that all works together, um, all based on dirt. One of the first commandments of God was for Adam to till and care for the soil. Maybe this was God telling us to pay attention to what's under our feet. If you look at the biblical view of human being stewardship over the environment, it provides a balanced view of our relationship to our natural world. Some think that the natural world is simply there for our use with impunity, that the only thing that matters is whatever human beings want to do. Uh, and the earth is sort of a, a sterile template that doesn't have any intrinsic value or dignity. Uh, that's not the biblical view, but the other extreme view would be that human beings are a parasite, that we're somehow an alien imposition and we're not really a part of the natural world itself. The biblical view is the perfect balance between these two things. God creates us along with the other creatures on the sixth day and draws us out of the ground from the dust of the earth. So from the very beginning, human beings are related to the physical universe and to the ground itself. God then gives us stewardly dominion over it, both to use and to till and to keep the earth, but also to preserve it and to exercise our wise stewardship over it. The biblical view of human beings' relationship to the soil, I think, uh, balances these two unfortunate extremes. So what responsibility do we have to care for and to sustain what God has created? God creates us as stewards of our natural environment. He gives us responsibility both to use, but also to preserve the inherent dignity of the soil, of the earth. That's the biblical view of stewardship in which we're a part of nature and God creates us and draws us from the dust of the ground and calls us to work the ground, to work the soil. Nevertheless, because of the fall, uh, we can damage it, we can harm it, uh, both for ourselves and for the other life on the planet. But God gives us minds as well. And just as we can harm the earth and can harm the soil, if we study it carefully, if we understand the ways in which the soil and the life it sustains interact, we can find solutions. Our land care practices greatly impact what goes on in the soil. If we remove our crop residues, uh, we're removing the food for the organisms, for those bacteria and fungi, which begin this whole cycle of, of nutrient, bringing nutrients to the plants. Uh, they help out a number of other ways through disease suppression and in soil water dynamics. And so having a healthy, productive soil with a full complement, a supporting cast of all these organisms present is so critical. Uh, you remove that food though, uh, you have lower populations and then you have to provide those nutrients in other ways and then we become more and more dependent on chemical inputs and so forth. But God has put in place uh, a system that's remarkably complex and thrilling and, and uh, we're just scratching the surface on, on what is actually going on there. It's important to know about soils because this is all we have. Um, there's no new earth being created that we can go take this is what we have and we need to take care of what we have and be aware of what it is and what makes it better and what destroys it so that we can be good caretakers of this little tiny section where we get all of our food from. I knew uh, that all life comes from soil and that we had to figure out how to help the soil get back to the way it was and we thought there's got to be a better way to farm. The, the soil uh, was totally sterile, was dead. Yes, we could grow 200 bushel corn an acre and we did and we have a plaque that says we grew 200 bushel uh, corn to the acre. But things just didn't feel right. One of the things that inspired us to change our farming practices from a, a row crop uh, type of farming, industrial farming, corn, soybeans, to an all-grass based farming system, it's a much healthier system. If we're to survive as a people and as an earth, we need healthy soils. There's no question, without a living, healthy soil, be no existence in the future. We went to the whole entire grass-based system, mm -hmm. utilizing cattle. The cattle do the harvesting and the cattle do the fertilizing. We manage the grass and we manage the cattle. 
Because we're, like Dorothy says, what are we? Caretakers. Caretakers. Yeah. We're not here forever. The land will be. We're like the grass. We're like the animals. We're like all the organisms. Uh, we have a life cycle, but the place will still be here. So as, you, as you're looking around the farm, uh, you're actually looking at the soul of Dorothy and I, of how we want our farm to look. One of the things that we've done in an industrial food system is we've removed the animals from the land. So the animals are in feedlots in the middle of the country and the farmers with their fields that could use that composted animal manure are on the periphery and miles and miles away. And so we really need to start thinking about soil conservation, farm conservation, where our food comes from. Obviously really, really important issues as we go into this new century. Outside Grand Rapids, Michigan is the community-sponsored agricultural farm, Trillium Haven. Their owners, Michael and Anya Vanderbrug, are raising pesticide-free crops without the use of chemical fertilizers for consumption by themselves and other shareholders of the 50-acre farm. Anya also enjoys teaching farm visitors about what they're doing. It's not just for us to use and abuse and use up, but that hopefully our children, and, and if not them, someone else is going to have this farm and it's going to be able to feed Grand Rapids and feed the people around here um, for hundreds and hundreds of years, which is how, you know, like the Chinese had little tiny plots of land that they had for 7,000 years because they knew feed it and feed it and feed it and it'll feed you back. You don't just use up your soil and use up, use up your land. And so everything that we do in all our farming practices here, we want to increase the productivity and the health of our soils. We don't practice burning or intensive tillage. We're, we're promoting those ideas, those techniques uh, that favor an accumulation of life below the ground. Because this is what supports life above the ground. ECHO analyzes local environments and their resources, whether in Indonesia or Siberia, and seeks to provide an inexpensive and successful program of sustainable food production. The world's poor often get the worst land, and the worst land in, in terms of farming is, is often steep hillsides. Uh, you're far from, often far from markets. It's difficult to bring pro your produce and your, your, your crops into the cities to sell. But the other significant uh, factor is these steep slopes, which um, are constantly exposed to, to rain, and uh, when that rain hits this steep grade, it is, obviously has this uh, effect of taking with it uh, soil and uh, your, your lightweight soil which happens to be organic matter that decaying leaves and sticks and such is, is some of your most important material in your soil. So to lose that is really hard for farmers and, and so you often see the poorest quality soil in steep hillsides. There's several ways to minimize soil erosion on hillsides. Uh, one method you see here is uh, planting the contour with tree species. Uh, it's, along, it's a hedgerow of densely planted leguminous trees. And these leguminous trees do a number of things. They, they anchor the soil. They're a wall that when the water hits it, it uh, leaves, the water goes through, allows the water to go through and leave behind the precious soil. Then in the alleyways between your hedgerows, uh, you're able to farm. And so when the water hits, it's just in this area here that you have uh, a rapid movement. Then it hits that wall of trees and slows down. So this is basically a sand dune. So to stabilize it, we have just overlapped tires. In fact, tires make a very nice uh, stair step to go over a steep area. The only reason we have wood here is so we don't catch our toe on it. If you didn't have wood, that wouldn't be necessary. It's working really well for us. It's just an incredibly steep slope of sand, and we've hardly lost anything from it over the six years that it's been here. Yeah, now is this a technique you could use overseas? Absolutely, because one of the big problems is disposal of tires. Uh, not only are they an eyesore, but the rainwater it collects in them breeds mosquitoes, which means you've got dengue fever and yellow fever and malaria. So this, this essentially has taken several tires that are no longer usable for anything else out of circulation and put them to a great use. Through its global research, 
ECHO has discovered varieties of avocado that produce their fruit in each of the 12 months of the year. By grafting these varieties into local avocado seedlings, growers can have fruit all year long. The trees that we grow in the nursery at ECHO, many of them are sent overseas to missionaries or development workers who are in the field who are wanting to bring in some improved uh, tropical fruit trees to their area, such as improved varieties of avocado or mango or citrus, or some things that have potential to be of great benefit to the people they work with but aren't yet in the area. So if we as, a, as an organization, as ECHO, can get high quality selected varieties of avocado into people's hands so that not just one month of the year we have avocado, but say 12 months of the year we have production, we've done a great service to that community. So we choose our, our main bud. On this one, we're gonna choose that big one there. Let this flourish, just as this one has. Take off these side buds, and so it becomes our new tree. Take off these shoots that are coming up from the rootstock. This one here was an example of how you would graft in a developing country where you don't have all the same supplies that we have here in America. This black piece of rubber band is actually from a, a bicycle inner tube, which are pretty common in a lot of other countries of the world. Because so many of the world's poor are compelled to work in large urban areas where many face unemployment, it's critical for them to find creative means of providing for themselves. ECHO has developed a number of techniques that poor urban dwellers can use to grow their own food. Even in places like a city where there's almost no soil, just pure concrete, uh, you can either make your own soil or make your compost uh, from kitchen scraps or if you have leftover grass clippings or any other vegetation that you can use. Um, or getting around uh, the traditional sense of soil and using things like uh, here we're growing things in wood chips or even pop cans on a carpet, um, using things that act as a soil um, if the soil is not available. To do this, uh, we lay a layer of carpet on the bottom and so the plant actually grows right into this carpet. So here you have the plant growing right into the, uh, right into the carpet. See its roots there, essentially no soil at all, a low-tech hydroponic system. Uh, where the plant's getting all its nutrients and water from this carpet that wicks, the water wicks from this, um, from these buckets, these irrigation buckets. Uh, just a simple five gallon bucket with a hole in the top. Here we have the tire garden, one of the rooftop favorites. Simple, no, no shortage of tires in, a, in a most urban areas. And it's a super durable container. Uh, and the plants do real well here. Uh, basically we'll cut the rim off Take that and flip it upside down and it fits nicely on the bottom. Uh, put a piece of plastic underneath so it'll form a nice seal. Fill that with um, soil, compost, what have you. And here we have garlic chives growing. These have actually been here for 13 years. And for a family, you know, having a couple tires of this, clipping off a few every, every evening to put in their food, good source of, of nutrition. Uh, it keeps growing like crazy. God created the world and the universe good and very good in the beginning and we're promised in the age to come not simply some angelic state of pure immateriality but a transformed heaven and earth, a transformed physical world which is good in its original created form, is fallen and is groaning in travails until the consummation of the new heavens and the earth to come. We now occupy the time between the original good Garden of Eden and the coming new earth where we will once again have the opportunity to live in harmony with our Creator and with the rest of His creation. We also live now with our Creator's mandate to be fruitful and to multiply in the good yet imperfect world. And so as caretakers of the land, we are left in time and in tension between these two worlds. Years ago, an influential Christian thinker named Francis Schaeffer gave us some help for living between these two worlds when he wrote, If individually and in the Christian community, 
I treat with integrity the things God has made and treat them this way lovingly because they are His. Things change. If I love the lover, I love what the lover has made.